Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Matt, and today I wanna to talk about my experience using the Fujifilm X-T3. So I've had this camera for less than a month now and I've been shooting with it over that period of time. It's been great to get to know this camera and see its strengths and its weaknesses. I'm originally coming from a Sony A7S. So I've had a bit of a look into the different cameras available. I was exploring mainly with the Sony A7 III compared to the Fujifilm X-T3. And I chose the Fujifilm X-T3 mainly because of its amazing video features. Now, of course, in the process, I gave up full frame and the amazing sort of low light capabilities that Sony has come to be known for. But so far, I'm enjoying that trade off. I think I'm really liking the Fujifilm X-T3. The fact that I can shoot 4K 10 bit up to 60 frames per second internally, and I can also do 10 bit 422 externally. It's a pretty versatile camera and, and the results I'm getting off the sensor, I'm very happy with the colors, the image, and even the autofocus as well. One thing I've noticed over the last month using this camera is the low light capabilities compared to the Sony a7S that I used to own and I'm sure the Sony a7 III as well, just they're not the same and that's fairly self obvious, but you definitely notice it in lower light situations, sort of situations when you've come to get used to the Sony sort of treating it like it's not an issue and then you get the Fujifilm out and you're suddenly bumping up the ISO quite a large amount and not seeing the color, the, uh, the brightness change too much or the exposure change too much on that monitor. You're starting to get a little bit worried. Um, but at the same time, I think for shoots, for example, like what I'm doing right now, I'm standing in front of a camera, I've got a light in front of me. That's not an issue, but definitely more for event work, that might be an issue. The other thing is image stabilization, which I did give up, uh, obviously going for the Sony a7 III, I would have got that. To be honest, I'm not missing it that much only because I haven't owned a camera yet with internal image stabilization, not one of the newer cameras anyway. The RX100 does have internal image stabilization. A previous camera of mine, the Canon HV40 had image stabilization <laughs> built into it. But the Sony a7S, the original Sony a7S, the Canon 60D I owned before that. Uh, the Canon C200, none of these cameras uh, have internal body image stabilization, in body stabilization. Uh, I've seen some of the amazing results with the Panasonic GH5, for example, which does have that feature. And in my mind, yes, it would be amazing to hold a camera just on my body here and just have it stabilized perfectly uh, to the point at which I wouldn't need a tripod or potentially a gimbal. But at the same time, I, I'm also pretty happy to, obviously, if I need certain shots, I potentially would invest in more in a gimbal, for example, or I would have some kind of steady cam or, or an image stabilized lens at the very least if I was doing documentary or event work. And that to me, that's not too bad, much of a bad trade off, unless of course you want to use this camera for your travel vlogs and everything else, in which case, yeah, the lighter the better. Potentially having an in body internal image stabilization would make more sense. But for me so far with the projects that I've shot, been really happy obviously using a tripod or you know even shooting handheld with an unstabilized 16 to 55 millimeter lens has been okay and i'm actually pretty amazed these days what software can do in terms of stabilizing an image uh, now of course anyone who just heard that who of course might think to themselves are you just saying fix it in post i never recommend that as just a solution but sometimes it's the only option so and it all makes the most sense. So for example, when I went overseas recently, I actually had the Sony a7S. It was the last trip that I took with the Sony a7S. And a friend, because I'd sold all my other Sony E-mount lenses, a friend lent me his 55 millimeter f1.8 lens. It has no image stabilization. The a7S Mark I had no image stabilization. So I'm just kind of rocking this camera, 55 millimeter lens. You're getting a lot of shake in that video. And really the only way it was usable and the only way it worked in the final edit was having um, digital image stabilization. And again, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you do need it sometimes for certain shots, it works really well. And that might make more sense given the kind of features that we have here with the X-T3 than investing in a camera solely to have internal in-body image stabilization. Another thing that's been sort of something to consider as well with this camera is the H.265 files. This is a newer format. Uh, it's the reason this camera is able to shoot things like 4K up to 60 frames a second in 10 bit, just because of that compression. Uh, but it does also mean editing is a bit more of a struggle. Now this is something that behind me at the moment is a 2017 iMac. Uh, it's basically spec'd out uh, to the max in most areas, except the RAM is not 64 gigs, it's like 40 something gigs and it struggles heavily with these 4K 10-bit files in terms of editing them on Premiere Pro. It just kind of comes to a halt and I'm getting a frame every 
like few seconds, uh, if that sometimes, and that's really a struggle. So for the, the project that I'm recently working on with this camera, for the first time in I don't know how many years, I've had to actually convert proxies to be able to work on this project effectively. And that's something to consider, obviously, if you're doing any bigger kind of projects. I know the newer Macs these days at least have a chip in them, which is supposed to be dedicated to handling H.265 files. But most people potentially might not have the latest technology, in which case it's definitely something to consider because it will take you more time to actually be able to process the file first before you start to edit it. And even bringing back those settings in Premiere, you know, half quarter resolution, I'm still getting some stuttering going through the frames. So another aspect that's really important to people these days is obviously autofocus. And I'm happy to report the Fujifilm X-T3 has some really good autofocus on board. Uh, it's not on the same level as Canon's dual pixel autofocus, but at the same time, it's more than usable enough for projects. Uh, I find that the settings do need a little bit of tweaking just because it tends to be quite video and quite snappy to begin with, uh, which is obviously not the preferred kind of smooth, you know, focusing that we would generally see if you're manually focusing, you're kind of getting these quick, these fast snaps. Uh, so I definitely recommend jumping into the settings, playing around with it, and making sure that the setting is back a little bit uh, in terms of speed so it does look a bit more natural. In terms of face tracking as well, I found face tracking to be pretty good and I've used it for an interview recently. It did get a little bit more confused when someone would like put their hand up in front of their face really quickly and I think it would, again, my settings might not be as, as good as they could be but it started to snap back like into a different focus point. And so there were a couple of like maybe one or two times which the, the focusing like moved minutely while the person was talking. And I kind of had to, to cover that up with some B-roll footage just because I thought it might be a little bit too distracting if, if obviously someone was to, to see that. But at the same time, I was shooting f2.8, which I still think is remarkable these days. You can shoot a talking headshot at f2.8, have people moving around and, and not have to worry about the, the camera going out of focus. I'm very much used to the Sony a7S where I was shooting at f4 or f5.6 so that I would have a larger plane of focus to work with in case obviously talent would move in and out. So when I first got the camera, I started exploring my options. Uh, I originally looked into getting an EF adapter, believe it or not, for the Fujifilm. And there aren't many available. There's, there's one main one, which I'll link to down below if you guys are interested. Um, but hearing from reviews, it seemed like it was pretty good and it was fairly decent. It worked with autofocus. But at the same time, I started to think that people rave about the Fujifilm glass. Um, they think it's some of the best glass that's available. So I, I kind of started to think to myself, why would I want to put EF glass on there if I could get better options out there that's more native to the system, especially autofocus as well. I know it would work better on native lenses, usually depending on the lens, of course. In terms of a cage, uh, at the moment, there's only a few available. So we have one from Small Rig, which is pretty reputable, a great company, but at the same time, it's a very small cage. It doesn't really have a lot of like points, I guess, compared to the tilter cage I was used to on the A7S. You also then need to sort of invest in a top handle, maybe a side handle, the base plate, the rods. It ends up being about $350 or so here in Australia. And again, just given the way I'm shooting with that camera at the moment, given that it has almost everything I need and the only thing I might not have is internal in-body stabilization, in which case I might be using a gimbal for it, I wouldn't be using the cage in that case either. Um, unless, of course, I was doing a lot of work which required 10-bit 422 output uh, and I was putting that to a monitor, I might look at the cage then. But even in that case, I think I've been pretty happy so far just having the camera by itself. And I'm starting to realize that's a really big benefit these days. I remember with the Sony a7S, it was all about rigging it out. It was all about putting the Atomos Ninja recorder on top of it so I could get the 4K out of the camera. And we've already come so far from that because now cameras are obviously recording 4K internally like the Fujifilm X-T3, the less you have to worry about, the less moving parts, you're definitely going to have less of a headache and it makes the whole filming process much more fast and efficient that way. So I would definitely say to you guys, if you're considering getting this camera or if you already have it, have a careful think about what are the key essential accessories you might need for it. And as much as possible, try and minimize the amount of moving parts or things that could go wrong because when you are shooting, I guess, any kind of project, you really do need to have gear that you can rely on and especially when you start to have things like adapters which are not made by the company who, who makes the camera that could be compatibility issues with certain lenses uh, when you start to have a cage with a whole bunch of stuff on it you need to make sure it's securely mounted you need to make sure the tripod can hold that amount of weight you need to realize that the camera is going to get heavier which is what happened with my a7s and the more moving parts you have obviously the more chance there is for failure but at the same time obviously there might be some key essential accessories you need 
Probably the biggest one I'd recommend is an external monitor, especially with the Fujifilm X-T3, you can get the 10-bit 422 out of it. So that's an option for you. Um, and I think the Atomos Ninja 5 would probably be the best way to go in that respect because it's a bit of a smaller monitor and it would obviously suit the camera a lot better than one of their biggest seven inch sort of Shogun monitors or anything like that. I guess the last thing as well with the Fujifilm X-T3 in my experience is I did recently shoot a project with it and for some reason, I believed I had the latest firmware. I didn't have the latest firmware. Um, and as I have found out, it's a slightly rude awakening. The latest firmware means that it can record files larger than four gigabytes, uh, video files that is. If you didn't have that firmware update, every four gigabytes the file would kind of split. And so I was shooting 4K, 10 bit, I think it was 200 megabits per second for a particular interview. And all of a sudden I opened up the, pro the SD card afterwards and had all these files which are about two minutes 40 and all of a sudden I had this heart attack that, oh my God, I've lost, like for some reason the camera stopped recording every two minutes and 40 seconds, like what's happened? Um, but it turns out all those files linked in with each other. It's just they were spread out and I had dual system audio going so I had to kind of sync them. I would have benefited from a program like Pluralize in that case, but I didn't have it. Uh, or I don't have that program particularly. So I kind of had to go into Premiere and sync each clip individually with the uh, the audio tracks and, and move everything across. So it was a bit painful. Make sure if you do get this camera, you update it straight away to the 2.0 um, 2 firmware or somewhere around that. I don't know what it will be once you do get the camera, but I had the, the V1 firmware, which obviously had all those kind of particular um, quirks with it. So definitely recommend look into that as well. So otherwise, I've been really happy with the Fujifilm X-T3 so far. I think it's a really great camera and I'd recommend it for people if you're having a look into it. Uh, th there's obviously trade-offs and I would urge you to consider given that there's, there's a lot of great options out there and there'll be more great options to come in 2019 that you do think about the aspects most important to you obviously before investing in the camera. Think about how you shoot now and don't necessarily even think about how you're going to shoot in the future because if you are looking at a new camera, you probably already have some needs that you, you need to satisfy right now or that you want to sort of fill those gaps that, that your current camera may not be doing the, the, the thing that you need it to do. So think about what's most important to you. And if the Fujifilm X-T3 makes sense, I could definitely recommend it. Um, I'm using the 16 to 55 millimeter lens. It's the only lens I own on the camera right now, but I definitely appreciate some suggestions. So if you guys already use Fujifilm, um, let me know in the comments down below what sort of lenses I should probably look into. And especially I'm hearing that some lenses aren't as good for autofocus on the Fujifilm X-T3. So I'm gonna keep doing some research. I'm thinking maybe a prime around the 35 millimeter uh, focal length, f1.8, hopefully a bit, bit better in lower light. I'm really happy with the footage coming off the Fujifilm X-T3 in comparison to what I've seen with the Sony a7 III. I think they're both excellent. So there's there's sort of no one's better than the other, but I definitely feel as though I like having the APS-C sensor for now. Obviously not so good in low light, but definitely uh, has a, a really nice image that I can use quite easily. And I, I, the project I'm currently editing on the moment, I'm just super happy that I was able to get this shot in the way that I was and I just, I love the look of it. I think it looks excellent personally, but otherwise, if you guys have any more questions about the Fujifilm X-T3, feel free to leave them down in the comments below as well. And I'll catch you guys next time. <sighs> Where's my tea gone?